Welcome one and all, this is the Peace Dealer and uh, this is episode four of Peace Talk where I profile astrologers and spiritualists on the YouTube or in the YouTube community who are creating awareness of this new age that we are in. And uh, excitingly enough, this episode, I have the Leo King. How are you doing, David? Yo, what's going on, buddy? How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Today uh, seems like it's going to be way more exciting than I even thought so. So looking forward to seeing how the energies play out. And uh, yeah. Right on, man. Well, thanks for having me on here. No, I'm very honored that you're uh, on this episode. For those of you who aren't really um, familiar with the Leo King, he is uh, one of the most active astrologers uh, in, on YouTube right now. I would say one of the best, in my opinion. Um, I've been following him for two years now. And um, one thing about the Leo King that really struck me as awesome is um, he would do a daily horoscope, or he still does do a daily horoscope every single day. Pretty sure if you're watching this, though, you already know, because you already follow him as well. So um, let's jump right into it. What really uh, got you into astrology? For those who don't already know, um, how did you begin your awakening process? Well, I'm a Leo, so it started by having fun. <laughs> it was actually, when I was young, my mom told me I was a Leo, and it was either at the library, I mean, it was so young that I, you know, I had to search for the information in libraries. I mean, I literally went to the library and found the Leo energy and started reading it, and I'm like, wow, this is so me. So I started really just paying attention naturally to people's birthdays, like, you know, when I was in junior high, I'd be like, oh, okay, they're a Taurus or they're this. And I just started doing that, like, oh, they're this. And I just remembered everybody's birthday. Like, that was the weirdest part about it. Like, I'm the kind of person I just remember your birthday. I'm also the kind of person that remembers what street we're on, when we crossed it. And I could go to somebody's house once and remember how to drive back there again. So that's how my mind works. That's how my energy works. And so with astrology, it was like the same thing. I was like, oh, my gosh, yeah, they're born this date. So I, they knew their sign. And the next thing I knew, I started going into high school, and that's when I really started dating girls, and I started knowing all their signs. And I always use the joke whenever I give the story, you know, I went through all the cheerleaders, and I had to find which ones were the best. It's kind of hard. They all look really good in those dresses. But, you know, <laughs> once you go inside, you know, there's a whole different story going on. And so those were the stories I started to play around with and figure out. And, and then the girlfriends I did have in high school, which was funny because – I didn't like any of the cheerleaders. I liked more of the girls who kind of had their own thing going on. And um, I had a couple great girlfriends in high school, and they really opened me up to astrology. I was dating my two big girlfriends in high school were a Taurus and a Capricorn, believe it or not. So, you know, and I'm a Leo, so it was like, you know, even though it didn't say those really work out with Leo, I wanted to see why I got along with them so well. It was almost like astrology wasn't working or something. But when you go into deeper with the charts, and I started looking in charts, it all started to make sense, you know? Nice, nice. Yeah, definitely uh, relate to uh, the speaking to ladies about astrology. I know when I started, uh, I definitely, I know like you say in other interviews, like you used it to pick up on chicks and stuff. Definitely really helped me as well, because there are really no dudes I can talk to too about astrology so you know women were are generally more open to this kind of stuff and it, it really did help me as well like to uh, gain more uh, insights I guess or, or practice and whatnot so interestingly enough as a Leo King how do you feel like um, being a Leo dis makes you distinct in the way you um, deliver your uh, astrology reports I know you usually say you know, your horoscopes are inspirational, which they totally are. So what what, what do you feel being a Leo, like, helps for, for someone who um, wants to watch you? Um, why, why does being a Leo help them? Or, yeah. 
Thanks. Well, yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, Leo's all about inspiration. It's all about the sunlight. It's all about fun, though, too. I always feel like I somehow know how to bring some really tough information out in a fun and exciting way. And, you know, as a Leo, I'll be honest, we kind of want to show off. And I use uh, my horoscopes as a way for me to show off. And I think it makes it interesting to watch. Um, and I started on a, on a laptop, you know, and it was like, how do I get people to watch my message when it's just somebody behind a webcam because actually not many people watch it when it's just behind a webcam you know uh, it, it, we're used to television we're used to this like oh my gosh this really nice presentation but I found that if I was a little bit wild I was a little bit crazy I was a little bit of a show off I, I would say things that really kind of got you a little bit you know woohoo ruffled your feathers that I could get your attention and I, it was all about attention so when I do it, it's about how do I grab your attention? How do I get your attention to the stars? And, and that's what I think I've mastered doing the whole Leo King thing. Awesome, awesome. Very, very good answer. Um, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned, too, about the way you deliver your horoscopes, you know, being fun, but you're also very truthful. And that's what I really love about watching your videos. And I uh, talk a lot um, about you know, this Pluto and Scorpio generation and how we're, you know, revolutionizing things. But I noticed you're all uh, Pluto and Libra at the very tail end. And I think it's awesome how, you know, you speak so much about living in our Scorpio truth. And I feel like you're, you really do a great job of like, you know, guiding the way and showing, you know, us younger generations, not to say like you're, you're like, way too old for us I feel like you're a perfect bridge almost but like what do you what do you feel could you give us like a Pluto and Libra uh, perspective and, and how like that really bridges in how these two generations here kind of play a force in, in this new like history we're making right now oh that's such a great question um, I've always looked at myself as a secret agent because I'm a Pluto and Libra, yeah, sure, but I'm at the cusp, right? I'm on 29 degrees, so my ass is in Scorpio and my boobs are in, like, Libra, you know? Like, you know, it's like a weird spot to be. And <laughs> Pluto is a generational spot. And with Pluto Scorpio and this new generation coming in, it's intense and it's actually harsh. One thing about Scorpio is it's harsh as hell. Scorpio is the harshest sign, takes no prisoners, literally. And so there's an intensity about it. But a Pluto Libra perspective is peace, harmony, justice, like bring the balance and, and bring the truth, but do it in a way that also allows us to like keep the flowers up and, you know, bring this happy vibration to it all. Scorpio can get so intense and so destructive, actually, that it comes down to really, you know, like kind of atom bombed out and everybody goes, okay, we did it, but it's a little ugly in here now, you know, and I think my message is to do the ugliness, but remember to keep the sweet, sweet flowers around too, because without that, you know, I'm not going to be able to have a Mai Tai on the beach and bring a hot, beautiful girl with me on there and enjoy the sunset, because really, Libra is about the sunset, because that's really the, de the, the definition of it. It's when the sun sets in astrology. It's that seventh house. It's the descendant. You know, it is where we descend. Scorpio is when we come underneath the descendant and what happens? Ooh, it gets dark. So it's, it's you know, the message I think I have is to the Pluto Scorpio generation is do the intensity, but make sure that there's still some sort of light around. Because if we don't have that light, it can get too dark. And Justin Bieber is an amazing example of somebody who's taken his Pluto Scorpio all the way down to nothing and taking cars and whether he kills somebody or not and I just you know I live in Hollywood there's a greatest story some girls that live above me were just at his house last week and he literally was trying to pay <coughs> girls to take off their clothes and treat them like like animals and just like oh take off your clothes at my pool and you know what I mean like that's a Pluto Scorpio like whatever I'm just gonna get it I'm obsessed to get it all the way but it's like there's there's got to be some sort of diplomacy and Pluto Librans are about showing up really nice and tailored and you know like delivering the message and even though the problem with Libra is it doesn't get down to the truth sometimes it can be unfair because the, the the court might say oh you killed that person even though you didn't but the court said it so you are I think that's the problem is Scorpio goes mother effer I didn't do it you know 
So you might have to cause that crazy destruction to get that truth. But there's, you know, I think both signs try and find a way to, to live happily together, which is not easy. No, not easy at all. And, and you're definitely right about, you know, Pluto and Scorpio, people going way too dark and just not really, you know, giving that balance. Um, what do you feel about uh, Pluto and Sagittarius and Capricorn? Um, how that generation will really move things forward? Do you feel like that's a pretty um, like pivotal generation right there as far as uh, how they'll be able to work with these energies? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. I believe in what's called uh, the, the three waves coming in, and uh, mm -hmm. you can research a lot about that, but... The first wave came in like the 60s, 70s, like that generation of, of people who came here to really move spirituality forward and, and those are the Pluto Le Leos and Pluto Virgos, you know, they had to see love on the planet, you know, basically the Pluto Leos really came in with lots of love to bring and even my father who's a Pluto Leo, you know, gosh, he's just living in his heart even in his 50s, you know, like just like you wouldn't even know he's 50 years old. So, but... I think that if we move forward, this these are the third waivers going to come in. I believe like the Pluto, Libras, and Scorpios are the second wave that are here to bridge a lot of this 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 information in a new way and and take where the first wave took us. You know, it's almost like there's been roads to actually walk on this time instead of having to make roads. I think that the Pluto Sages are here to explode it. That third wave will will explore the areas of where we take all this and take it to its biggest potential. And that Pluto Capricorn will kind of concrete it all in and I think be a long kind of ending towards this big transformation and really building that new foundation of this new world that we're creating. And I think they'll take it and really do something powerful with it. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I, I could totally see that too, um, especially Pluto and Capricorn. Um, what do you, another thing about your horoscopes, I, I do want to get back to Pluto and Capricorn, but another thing about your horoscopes that I found distinct is you're not afraid to really, you know, speak out about channeling info and, and interacting with other, you know, um, constellations like uh, the Palladians and whatnot. What, what are your thoughts on um, people really coming into more contact with like ETs and whatnot as the veil is lifting. Well, that's a really deep, profound subject. Um, I really started getting into Palladian energy around the 2012 uh, alignments. I I was very big in 2012 and the, uh, the Mayan calendar shift and I wanted to find out what that was about. And I started actually not going down the road of the Mayan way. I started going more into this higher vibrational kind of multi-dimensional look and I came across a lot of Palladian channel energy and when I started channeling it it really called to me really awoken a part of me that was embedded really Palladian energy is all about reawakening things that are embedded in you already and really the Palladian energy represents light if you go down in the ancient ancient kind of vibes describing our universe our sun is really a spun-off star from the Pallades galaxy, from the Seven Sisters. So you can start to kind of like really start to see how really when we talk about ETs, everybody keeps thinking of these weird aliens on other planets. When it's much deeper of maybe it's, you know, there's something called gods, you know, and everybody goes, what the, why do we say God, and then why do we say gods? Was it really maybe a bunch of people who created us, or was it one God? And what, what I think I try to show people is when I look at ETs, or I look at this, is there is the almighty creator that has created it all, but from that point of consciousness, there's always going to be a next form after that, and then a next form, and the infinity goes down. So there's always going to be something really close to God, but not there, and then something that's secondly close to God, but not there. And those are the gods. And so when you start to research ETs, it's not crazy to think that multiple beings created humanity, and that's what gods are, are. and then there's the god after that. And I think that when you start to, like, look at that kind of energy, you start to see on how, why the astrology is turning, what's happening in the deeper aspect of the cosmos, and, and my whole point here is that 
astrology is more than earthbound Mars, Pluto, Mercury retrogrades. It's like that is just the little, the fragments of like, I call it the little, the little things that are happening on Earth, the little pin needles. But when, <laughs> you're not a true astrologer unless you're seeing the dimensions turn in the, in the actual, the sun's position around the galaxy and understanding how the galaxy is turning and then understanding where our galaxy truly is. Like without that knowledge, you do not understand true astrology. You will never be able to understand where we're turning here, if that makes sense. So I use that energy to kind of help people understand where we're at now. Totally agree. Um, it, I mean, it's as simple as watching other astrologers. This isn't to put down other astrologers, but you could tell who's really, you know, using textbook definitions to describe transits and who really has, like, the perspective on how to bridge what we're learning and whatnot. And um, you said something earlier which um, could really be controversial about there being gods, but I resonated with, with it so much. I mean, even the Bible says um, in the beginning, God was like, let us make men in our own image, which talks about being more than one person. And um, when, uh, yeah, other than... Uh, going to expose more on the, oh yes, 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 um, it, it's really made me question the term God, like I don't really even pray to God anymore, because I feel like God is just a title, and if I just say, God, can you help me with that, any entity could just assume the title of God, and it, it's kind of forcing me to really like dig deeper into my spiritual truth and, and see like, all right, who, what do I really believe? Who do I really believe and work with? Like, is this is spirituality just something I put up in the air, or or do I really want to get intimate with you know these higher forces? And I think it's awesome that you do study the sun on a much broader spectrum. It kind of just almost solidifies your legitimacy as an astrologer. Because honestly, I have not heard any other astrologer really even talk about that. And I know they're. There are many. There's there are a few astrologers that do look at, at that, but just the fact that you don't really hear that awareness, it, it should be exciting to see more people um, talk on that level. So um, I guess yeah, back the to sun, the sun's the reality. It's the projector. I always like say that, you know. So really, everything's gonna come out of that spot, you know. Like that's our projector, and I feel that that's the connection that the suns around our galaxy and the stars. They really are the projectors of the reality, and they have the connection back to home base, wherever that is, you know? And I feel like you have to go to the sun. You have to go to the star to access the information. And, and that's the only way. That's, why, that's why Western astrology is based off the sun. It's not based off the planets. People don't realize that. Vedic astrology always tries to put down Western like, oh, they don't even, the procession and the equinox, they're not even looking at the right constellation. Well, sorry to tell everybody that Western astrologers only give a flying crap about the sun and its ecliptic <laughs> and its relation to Earth. We don't care about the planets. We follow the planets and how its relationship is to the sun. It's like... You know, the way that the planets follow the sun in that chart based off the way the sun is is how we do Western astrology. That's why it doesn't go along with where we're looking at because we don't care what we're looking at. We're only paying attention to the sun's relationship to Earth, you know? True. It makes, it makes a lot of sense, especially since looking at it from Earth, it's, it's just a much more limited perspective. It really does make more sense to... Have the sun be the focal point. I totally agree. Um, yeah, I guess uh, barring back on this Pluto and Capricorn, this is awesome. Uh, we're just mowing down topics <laughs> extremely quickly. Uh, what What do you feel like? Because uh, I, I mean, Pluto's only at thirteen degrees right now, so it's really yet to um, truly unleash. And with with Neptune and Pisces. Where do you feel um, this energy is headed to us? How, how much transformation do you feel Pluto and Capricorn alone will, will usher in for us as far as like government structures no longer having any power and new powers resurfacing? <laughs> it's a while. You know, everybody thinks like, oh my God, next month the economy is going to crash. Like one thing <laughs> about a Pluto and Capricorn is it will not crash like that. Just no, it. People are more obsessed with keeping the structures actually together. 
That's the funny aspect of it all. So all these people that keep predicting the fall of the economy, you know what? It's just not going to happen. We're going to just keep borrowing money to keep it together. We're just going to keep, you know, people will do anything to keep it together, really, because we don't have another plan. <laughs> and so Pluto and Capricorn is trying to search for the other plan. Once that plan's found, we can do something about it. So I think it's it's not so much about the structures breaking as a lot of people look. I think that's part of it. But they think that's only the smidget. I think looking for the new plan is what will solve the problem instead of trying to get rid of the old one. You know, whenever you have an old plan that doesn't work, you don't try and, you know, I guess you could try and fix it, but if it's not working, you just go to another plan. And I think what we're searching for is that other plan in our life. And we're searching for that other foundation to build. But I think we're far away. If you just do the history, Pluto and Capricorn last time, it wasn't until Pluto reached 29 degrees that George Washington and all them started doing the Declaration of Independence. So it wasn't like at 13 degrees they were doing that stuff. At 13 degrees they were sitting like complaining about the taxes for another 10 years, you know. So then if you go before that, that was King Henry VIII in, uh, in England and he was hating the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church Pope was in control of every country. He told Italy what to do and actually Italy was part of the whole entire energy. But, you know, the Pope told every country, do this, do that, don't do that. Go to war here, don't go to war here. And King Henry VIII was like, F you, I'm going to do it my own way. And that was Pluto and Capricorn. So, you know, I think that it's going to be a long, long transit. And I think that not until the 2020s do we really see this new plan kind of implement. I think that we're, we're going to see the next six years of this same structure. Of course, little by little change, but it's far away. And if you think that monetarily the system's going to crash, you're completely an idiot because it will not do that. Pluto and Capricorn will do until the last minute because Capricorn is literally going to hold on. Capricorns don't die until they're whittly and on canes and they hold on to the last second. You know, and so that Pluto will it will extreme that energy, and oh this system will hold on till the last second, the last breath. And we're not even close to seeing it fall, if that makes sense. We're actually seeing it get more increased. I would say I'm saying it's getting stronger, but it thinks it's stronger until the tower falls. You know, so the tower's still got to build to its peak, if that makes sense. We're not at the peak yet of you know. <clears throat> That, that was phenomenal. Um, definitely opened up my eyes right there. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really great perspective. That's really awesome. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's really interesting seeing that you have this influence over so many individuals over such a short span of time, um, and it's only going to grow. What, what do you feel is like, I mean, other than, you know, creating communities and talking about it, how do, you, how do you feel about, like, maybe in 10, 20 years when astrology is way more accepted to the point where everyone um, wants to know, everyone can, like, have a, a basic understanding of a chart, and it's not like they're that, you know, astro-literate anymore. Do you feel it'll take, like, five years, 10 years, 20 years before, you know, people start talking about, oh, my Mercury was, you know, squared by this today, and it just becomes casual convo, or do you think it'll still stay, like, um, you know, as just a, a kind of, I don't want to call it fad or group kind of thing, but when do you well, think it'll permeate our culture? You know, I don't know if it actually will for a long time. I hate to say that. Interesting. That's I, very I, I think... Uh, We've been talking about this structure and this this foundation. I think for the next decade, we're going to continue to see the same thing be playing out for a while. And I don't I don't think this energy will change. I think a lot of people and I always say there's couple there's boats that come in and then there's boats that leave. And I think there's been some powerful boats that arrived with this information and you jumped on them and they're taking off and we're all kind of taking this energy in our lives and directions. But unfortunately, I feel that, you know, I don't want to say people missed the boat, but I want to say that those boats came in. 2012 was, the universe even had it on every TV ch channel. Everybody had an opportunity to connect with this energy, connect with a higher purpose, connect with it, and the universe comes in cycles. 
And these cycles in, in the middle of you and I talking right now is the biggest revolutionary astrological cycle maybe in our lives. With this grand cardinal cross in between eclipses, the universe has shown up with the boats. It's tried to awaken you. It's tried to get you on this path. It's tried to get you out of the matrix. And then it's going to, people are going to be out of the matrix doing their thing and trying to get to wake people up still for another decade or more. You know, it's just going to be that story that this is going to be a lot of work to shift the paradigm. It's going to be a lot of work for people to open up to this energy. And, you know, even people that have been studying astrology for four years still tell me, like, I still have no idea what you mean that Neptune square is squaring their progressed sun. I'm like, well, you know, it's just something you're either born with or you're not, too, I think. And I think that you can study for 30 years astrology and still have no freaking idea the true meaning of a progressed sun square Neptune. Like, you, you know, it's like, so... It, it, it's just, I feel that a lot of people came down here to shift the paradigm with this information. And that's what these people are here to do. And I don't think it's all about understanding or knowing astrology and making it to where people are going to say they know their Mercury square Jupiter. I think it's just whether or not people are going to awaken to who they are. They might not have to do it through understanding a planetary-like alignment. But I think that astrologers help people understand that. And it's almost like if the people want to learn, they can. But I don't think people are going to learn this art. It's really ancient. And if anything, I think there'll be new arts that will that will bring people to enlightenment in ways that maybe mere astrology, but maybe this art won't be how it's done, you know? That's very interesting. I really appreciate this so far. The answers are very raw and truthful and kind of... Um you know, you're not really trying to sell anyone a dream or, or hope. You're just keeping it real. It's real. <laughs> you know, I got to keep it real, dog. <laughs> um, definitely do resonate with new um, ways of, you know, ushering in spirituality. I think your spiritual house music sessions are genius. That is very, very awesome. If you guys aren't aware, the Leo King actually does weekly um, spiritual house music sessions, which, you know, combines astrology, house music, and, you know, spiritual vibes and, and gathering communities to get together to just chill out and, you know, learn more about the week. Um, I, I guess I also like how you're saying, you know, a wave came and the boats left. It reminds me of, like, the, the energy of the rapture. You know, everyone kind of expected, you know, bodies to leave and, and whatnot, but... Um, it kind of, it kind of could be something like that too, where like, you know, it comes in like a thief in the night. If you're prepared for it, if you're open to it, you receive it, and if not, then you, I guess you're just not necessarily aware or not. But um, I, I definitely do. I'm looking forward to, you know, whatever new ways are emerging. Um, I, I could totally see that as far as like. You know, and, and and of course not not new things like a new dance move that that gets uh, popular for a bit and then fades away. It'd be really interesting to see how things progress. So, what about um, sex culture? In your opinion, how is that going to revolutionize as far as like people being more aware of rape culture and people, you know, having more control over their sex lives? Sex is an interesting uh, topic, especially if we go back to the 60s, 65, 66, 67, when Pluto-Uranus conjuncted in Virgo, and how we're seeing Pluto and Uranus now square for the first time. It's their first quarter energy. So this is the waxing period. You know, This is powerful. This is trying to take the 60s revolution and implement it into the seeding of our society now and actually do it. I mean, I could pull up on my, my phone and look at porn if I want. I mean, literally, <laughs> sure. that, like, like that was not happening even in the 60s, but it was an ideal that was like, wow, I should be able to go walk to my neighbor's house and take off my clothes. Wouldn't that be cool? And they experimented with that. That's Pluto Uranus. Like, whoa, my gosh, especially when it's conjunct. I wish I would have lived through that. Maybe I did, but, you know, <laughs> wow, like what a revolution. Now we're having it square. It's trying to implement this new sexual freedom, love, energy, but there's problems. The system doesn't allow it. The individual is trying to break free, but the system is holding the individual. That's Uranus and Aries squaring Pluto in the system. Like, I want to go do this, but oh my gosh, I have to have a job to pay my bills to do this. It's like, 
<laughs> so, yes, I think sex culture is important, but I think what's more important than the sex culture is the ability for a human being or an individual to be free of a system, which it's possible in a square. You know, one thing about a square is it's not impossible. It means that there's in really impossible work, but you can make it through. And a good example is my life. I do not need the system to survive. I have my own system. I can put up videos every day, have clients come to me in my house and my energy in my office and create my own system to be free to talk about astrology, to be free to DJ house music every week and monetarily live off this. So we all have to find that. But it's the hardest thing you do when you have to be a Uranus and Aries. You need to really be who you want to be and you've got to leave behind that system and those fears around that system and whether that's, you know, you want to be sexually free in this way or if you want to do this, I think sex, if anything, is, is a way to connect with the energy that we want to connect with. That's all it really is. It's the only, you know, physical aspect that connects us to an invisible emotional roller coaster, you know, and I think that sex is nothing unless you're truly free in the individual you want to be. I think that people can try and escape through sex to feel good, but I don't think sex is as powerful as it can be because if you're the individual you want to be, and let's say you find another individual who's in their self, that sex is going to literally blast you to other dimensions. And I think unless sex is blasting you to another dimension, you're, there's something off. There's something not right. You're not in true sexual energy. That sex is so sacred and it's so powerful. And it, it, I literally have literally gotten more downloads through sex than any other position. I used to just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, I see it. Okay, yeah, yeah. And you know, like that's oh my God. sex is for. It's receiving. So it's not only the receiving from, yeah, sure, if you're getting a blowjob or... If, the guy's doing that to you, you know, and I'm not afraid to talk about this stuff. Like, that's receiving, but there's a higher receiving that comes through sex, and you have to be with the right partner, the right energy, and you have to be free of the system and free of your energy and free of your fears to connect with that, you know? So beautiful, so true. I, I totally resonate with that, like, as far as, um, you know, being responsible, thankfully, with Saturn and Scorpio to our approach to sexuality, being that we can download so much um, amazing information through such a sacred act, um, it, it just to imagine like a whole bunch of awakened and enlightened individuals just getting together to do so. Well, I, of course, in their own intimate ways, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just fascinating to think about. Um, and, of course, the flip side is to, to be real with yourself. And, you know, I, I like how in your videos you're not afraid to say, hey, if you're not really feeling, if that's not someone you'd want to have sex with, then, you know, which... <laughs> I'm don't so do it. <laughs> I, I don't do it. And I used to go to some crazy Hollywood swinger parties when I was like 22. I, I remember I was like 22 at the club. I had this awesome girlfriend. We were, we were amazing. And we'd go to these swinger parties, and we didn't swing. But, you know, like the temptations are there or whatever. But if it's not who you are, you don't do it. You just That's not your truth. My girlfriend and I would look at each other and be like, that's not us. Let's just go. We can go. We can go do our own thing. Like, <laughs> we love each other. We're good. We didn't need to swing. Maybe some people do need to swing. But whatever it is, in your life, you got to do what you got to do. And, and, you know, especially I remember in high school, it was like I was not going to go just ask a girl to the dance to ask a girl to go to the dance. Like, I was going to pick the best girl to dance. Like, I would, like, like the girl I'm asking to go with, like, pfft, whew, I'm going to pick the hottest girl I can because that's me and that's what my truth is, uh -huh. you know. And I think you have to follow that lead. And those are simple examples to deeper issues, I think, that we have to follow, you know. All right, so uh, I'm going to take a small break just to play a quick uh, game. Uh, this is usually a part uh, in a peace talk where we take turns asking each other um, questions astrologically, um, just about like like if if and or questions. So we could we could uh, alternate uh, three questions each. I'll actually go first. Uh, who do you think? Um, and of course, 
these are pretty general questions, but uh, who do you think is able to um, manifest more? Oh, this isn't a really good question. I'm, I, I was going to say between Taurus and Capricorn, who do you think is able to really um, take hold of manifestation power, which every sign can do, but how would you like really um, differentiate those two signs? Well, those two signs are extremely similar and extremely different. One thing about Capricorn is it loves to start things. It will just, it'll get on it, it'll start it, it'll make it happen, but then it'll find everybody else to do the work for him. Whereas Taurus will see something, know the worth, and want to feel the worth all the way through. We'll want to be on the project till the end. We'll want to see it succeed till the end and be the best it can be. Whereas Capricorn just goes, well, I want it to be accomplished, but I kind of want to be the one that just said I did it and have my name on it. But I don't know if I really want to do all the work. You know? I don't okay. hire people. I'll get people on it. So it's two different energies, whereas the Taurus will can burn itself out, but the Taurus is a stamina punch. It's a fixed earth sign. So from the, mo the moment it starts it to the moment it ends, it's doing the work. Whereas a Capricorn will start it and lose interest in it and be like, well, as long as I get the, the recognition for it, I'll be okay, you know? And then we'll go start something else, you know? So I think, like, in the end, I would say the Taurus could manifest more, of course, because it feels the worth. That's what manifesting is, is the feeling behind it. Like, I freaking am the fastest in the world, or I am the best I did, or I created the greatest business and it changed the most people's lives. A Capricorn could be like, yeah, I got the trophy back there, but might not feel, it didn't feel what the trophy felt like to go get it. Maybe it, it was just, it, it was a trophy, of, you know, it's a CEO example. Like, I'm the CEO of Kellogg's, even though I have no idea how we started. <laughs> you know, like, 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 I have no idea what it feels like to work at Kellogg's, except I know how to run the company, and I, I once in a while go check in and see how people are doing, you know, but I don't know, you know, but, but the Taurus is like, oh my God, we use wheat and grain and da da da, and it's the best for you, you know, it like literally feels in it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That's very interesting, that makes a lot of sense. I know Capricorn is I use, therefore I am, so I definitely need to... They definitely love to delegate. That's what they actually. Oh yeah. So now I ask a question. Yep. And it could be on and anything. Yeah, it could be whatever, really. Um. Oh gosh. I don't even know where to begin here. Um. This caught me off guard. <laughs> um. I don't know. Spirit keeps telling me to talk about the nodes, so. Yeah, like what? What do you think? Um, what do you think the transition of the nodes in this Libra and Aries are doing right now uh, for for relationships? Oh my gosh, that is oh man. Um, I it's only until now now I'm really feeling it and the necessity for it because while I was in Scorpio, like I was all like relationship crazy, but I was just really able to understand before I'm ready to partner up with people, what is this deep, what at your deepest, 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 deepest core do you want? Because I'm, pre I'm pretty sure we all didn't really know truly. And now that it's in Libra and we do have, I mean, we're still figuring it out, but now that we have a better um, understanding, I, to me, like, these, these nodal um, influences in Libra and Aries are just really, really showing me, like, all right, what kind of partnerships, I hate to sound cliche, like, I know Libra is partnerships, but really, like, what kind of people could we get together to make this happen? And it's showing me, like, the kind of person that I, I want to be, need to be, the kind of people that maybe I normally would have just jumped into stuff with, but, you know, all right, let me not just think about myself. Could we realistically come together and make something happen? Um, yeah, superficially on the surface we can get together, but thankfully, because it just caught out of a North Node in Scorpio, we just learned that whole lesson of, well, hold on, let's make sure, you know, it's, it's in our truth first. So I really do believe that North Node in Libra is like 
really, really bring people together to, to accomplish a lot. Like, this isn't to say you can't do anything on your own, but I feel like while you're taking that self note in Aries and, you know, taking the initiative to stand, you know, in your truth, not waiting for anyone to identify you, but while you're identifying yourself, like you're literally just being pair matched with the universe to people who, depending on, you know, what kind of boundaries you put up, of course you can't just, I'm pretty sure the universe is also going to send tests to send uh, maybe people who aren't right for you. Um, but I know for an example, like when the North Node moved right into Libra, um, the person who set up my uh, artist's uh, domain name page was a Libra. And um, it kind of really just tied me in to like, okay, um, even, even the Libra signs are just really on it as far as helping people move forward on their path and whatnot. But I really do believe like as far as relationships go, like um, it, it kind of borders on the sappy. Like I really do feel people will reunite almost just because they're finally ready to because you're being forced to, to sit down and look at who you truly are and based on who you truly are, who can you join with. Yeah, I think that new unions and powerful unions and karmic reunions are for sure coming together, you know, like overwhelming. Yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Even, especially with existing relationships, like I'm finding myself bond closer to my, you know, sisters, my parents, my, my friends that, you know, I didn't really talk to um, much in the past. So it's, it's really beautiful Libra energy. I love it. Um, I guess uh, as far as the next question, um, who would you rather um, if who would you rather have jealous of you if you had to choose one person? Not to say you want anyone jealous of you, but if you pissed off someone and they were going to get revenge on you, would you rather it be an Aquarius or a Scorpio? I'd rather have a, an Aquarius seek revenge on me because they would get over it really fast. Whereas a Scorpio could live their whole life and be jealous and pissed at you and be trying to destroy you and manipulate the situation and manipulate people around you. Whereas an Aquarius does not want to manipulate people. It cares too much. It would, it would actually want to fix the whole problem later on. So, you know, the, the Scorpio would not care. It'd just be like, no, you know, like, and not saying that's how Scorpios, like, truly are, but once you get the burning going, once you get the obsession in, woo they just don't like the obsession. So if they were obsessed with killing me, well, yeah, I would not really want to say that. <laughs> uh, an Aquarius just gets over it fast. Aquarius get over things really, really fast. So it's like, oh, yeah, I'm over it. Like, whatever, I told them whatever. And then they go talking to Sue about it, and they're just like, yeah, I was kind of mad, but, you know, whatever. Like, they just detach. So, yeah, I would totally pick the Aquarius. And I don't know one Aquarius that's ever asked or seeked for revenge. I think, you know, maybe the only one might have been, like, George Washington, but I don't even think he was doing it for, <laughs> I think he was doing it for America, you know. Like, what, about, what about a Cancer and a Scorpio? Um, that would be kind of a tie, you know. I think, well, well, the Scorpio is going to be tougher about it. The Cancer is going to maybe, you know, just show up at your doorstep at the worst time, you know, <laughs> like when you have the, like a new girlfriend and then they come to your door and you're like, that's the worst time, don't come now. Like, why are you creeping on me, you know? Like, and they'd be very open about it and exposing, you know, it'd be like a Scorpio would totally hide it and lie to people about it and not let it out. Whereas a cancer would be like, it would be on the news, you know, it'd be like, they did this, you know, like, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so maybe it'd be worse, especially if you're a celebrity or public figure, you wouldn't want to piss a cancer off because they'd be, you know, crying on television about it. Whereas a Scorpio would be deviously setting up all these energies and, you know, you wouldn't even realize it that the mailman was paid off to kind of, like, trip you, you know? Like... Mm, oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Scorpio could be very devious like that. That's pretty cool. Just the yeah, if you were if you were stuck... My question is, if you were stuck on an island with one sign, which one would you pick? Oh, my God. That is such a good question. Um, damn. Honestly, I would if I was stuck 
with one sign, I would say I would have to choose um, a Sagittarius. But a Sagittarius whose son is like at least progressed to Capricorn because we would probably we'd probably spend majority of the time like trying to figure out a way to leave the island or or come up with something. Or even if we didn't try and leave the island, I just feel like I just feel like I could live on an island with a Sagittarius and like make it into our island or something like that. Yeah, that was a really good question. Uh, or, or if if it wasn't a Sagittarius, maybe an Aquarius, maybe. But yeah, I feel like I feel like I'd be able to balance out um, that energy as far as or. Um, or you said it, one. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> I was about to name the whole Zodiac wheel. <laughs> What's your final right. answer? Yeah, I'm going to have to say Sagittarius. Um, I, just, I just have the gnawing feeling that even though I would want that, I would regret it like three weeks later. Like, oh, my God. Why am I, <laughs> why am I with this freaking mutable loser? But... Um, no, I, yeah, I would choose Sagittarius. I feel like that would be cool. Um, I, uh, if being that you're a Leo, um, what what fire sign do you feel you resonate um, better with based on your chart, an Aries or a Sag? On my chart, Sag, because they uh, you know they love to laugh and they love to have a lot of fun and kind of disconnect from some seriousness in the world and. You know, I've uh, my best roommate was a Sagittarius. We, her and I, we laughed every night. We used to have the best times. Like we just every day was f like a new adventure, and we just used to we were we were popular. We used to have the cool like house. So everybody came to our house. We used to go down on the beach to Main Streets to ride our bikes. I mean, we had the best time ever. And so I resonate so much with the Sag and the fun and the adventure and the. And they're just kind of like taking everything out of this context and bringing it to these out of these world places. I feel when it comes to reality, you know, I can relate with the Aries and making how I make work done or ach achieving things. But I'm very out of this world, and and I like to leave Earth, and I leave Earth with Sages. And plus, I'm really attracted to Sag women. Like I just, there's something about it. I just, Irresistible. <laughs> They are. I think they've been going through a lot, though, and I think they're going to even get more attractive here in the next couple of years when Saturn comes in their sign and fi fixes a lot of them, you know, and I think they're all being fixed very intensely right now, so. You ain't never told no lie. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. So, uh, how many, was that my third question or my second? Yeah. Oh, that was your third. That's I think I have question. one more question for you. Mm -hmm. Um, if, um, if you were stuck in a car with one sign, which one would you want to talk to for the whole trip across America? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, um. Because you're a Gemini, um, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Which one would you want to talk to? I know you guys can get really bored with people really fast, so. Yeah, extremely. Um, thankfully, though, because of my Taurus, I, I'd really rather just, like, want to chill. So for that reason, you know, I would, yeah, like, if I was on a road trip, I'd rather just, like, smoke weed and listen to music to the music the whole way. But to be honest, like, I really, really love, like a Mercury and Sag or Sagittarius could talk way too much for my taste, which I like anyway, because I, I just like to listen to people, but I like when I have conversations with an Aries, a Leo or a Libra, because they really do open your mind up. I would have to say it's a tie between Aries and Leo, because the fire signs are like my spiritual house cusps, so those two signs just open my mind up to like all sorts of crap. 
So it's not really like a mundane conversation, especially with an Aries. Like, they just know how to like, at least for me personally, um, if, if I was on a road trip with them, um, I could totally, and, and being that I'm a Gemini, I'm their third house, so the, the conversations would definitely be lively, and I feel like I'd be able to have a lot of fun um, talking with them on that aspect. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to have to go with, with Aries. And then it's kind of reversed with me and uh, with the Leo. It's the same thing, but um, just a different kind of aspect of it. So yeah, I'd have to say it's a tie between those two signs. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, before we uh, wrap up here with one more question, um, what are three signs, and this doesn't have to be legit, necessary zodiac signs, they could be specific energies, let's say like a Venus in Taurus or a Sun in um, Pisces, what three um, signs or energies are your favorite to experience and what three are your least favorite or most challenging? Oh, geez, you shouldn't put me on a thing like that (laughs) when everybody watches me. (laughs) Well, how about I'll give you the three that I enjoy the most. I don't think I'm going to do the three I don't. Yeah, that's, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, <laughs> well, I would pick a Sag in my little group because I need that crazy out of the box. And also Sages, you don't, they're not clingy. So, you know, it's like, they, you know, they're like dogs to me. Like one minute they're on your lap, the next minute you're like, what are you doing in the corner over there? But I like that about them because they're able to just free themselves and aim in all these places, and I love that. Um, and I need a Taurus. Like I just always need a Taurus in my group. I have got my moon there. Uh, I just love the Taurus energy. You want a Taurus on your team, you know? They're going to... And, and I have the best laughing conversations and the best jokes and the best experiences with Tauruses. I just do. So um, I love Taurus energy. They make me feel good. They, they know how to feel good. One thing about a Taurus is, you know what, when you, they have fun or they do anything, we're going to do the best. If we're going to go to dinner, let's order the ribeye and let's have that. And yeah, just get the bottle, you know. It's like, like I need that energy around. I'm that kind of guy. Like I'm going to enjoy life. I'm a Leo with a moon in Taurus. I'm going to go to the best of the best. And that's where I think in spirituality, and this is kind of off topic, but I want to bring this up, you know, there's this feeling in spirituality like you can't enjoy life. Like you've got to do so so many things by the rules. You need to wear this perfume and this necklace and this smell and this sage over here and that over there. And you've got to be very respectful to Gaia and all, you know, it's like way too like, hello, like, <laughs> like the reality is however you want it. You know, like, if you want to have a Taurus at your dinner table and you guys want to order the ribeye and you guys want to laugh your ass off all night, gosh, the universe really wants that. And I think that's important. I just wanted to bring that up because that's something I really kind of get all cringed about when people start to judge, especially me and how I do astrology as if I'm like this Hollywood person that's not spiritual. But um, my third and final pick, oh... That's a difficult one, man. Yeah, it's kind of hard when you're. I would probably. I mean, it would. I mean, it would be for me a toss-up between another Leo because I would need that another person that's willing to go be glammy with me. Like, if we're gonna go to the club, like I need somebody else who'd just like be like, "Yeah, I'm the shit too," and be like, "Oh, <laughs> Hell yeah." <laughs> Um, or I was going to say another Gemini. Like I need Geminis to keep me stimulated and they're quirky and fun and exciting. <laughs> but I think that the other Leo would 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 make it for kind of a uh, a fun energy and give me a little competition too. I need I need competition in my life. Uh, <laughs> keeps, me going. keeps me going. I mean yeah. every day. I mean I hate to say it when I do the astrology horoscopes. I'm I'm I'm. It's a competition. I want to beat everybody. That might sound stupid, but it makes me better every day. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to be the best I can for the people every day. And I look around and go, how can I make myself better today? How can, and I'm in competition with myself even. How do I make yesterday's horoscope lose? That's how I look at it every day. I want to make last horoscope lose. You know, Every day I literally feel that way. I'm like, God, i got to make it better. You know, 
So. That's awesome. Uh, well, that makes sense how, I guess, as fire signs are naturally competitive. Um, that's, that's, that's interesting how you said that, too, because if we didn't have that, like, um, desire to excel, I mean, we wouldn't have better uh, production and just be content with mediocrity. So I do appreciate that. Um, so I guess to wrap up, what, what, what is your advice to an aspiring astrologer, or more importantly, what are your advice to people watching now who may not know how exactly to stand in their truth during these very important times? What, what could you inspire them to do so that they could move forward from now on, not afraid to be who they are? Well, my first thing in advice, and I take this from my own like energy, is, man, I didn't listen to anybody. Man, you asked my parents. When I was 18, I rebelled because I wanted to leave the matrix. I knew that the system was effed up, and I knew that it was based off fear and energy, and I didn't even like know that maybe logically, but I knew that feeling-wise, and I knew I had to follow my heart and do what felt right. And if it didn't feel right, I didn't do it. If it did not feel right, I didn't do it. And I'll say that 15 times again because... If it doesn't feel right, run the F away, you know? And you got to go to break through this paradigm. You know what? You got to trust. You got to, it's not easy work. And if, if you think there's a school that teaches you how to do this, you're crazy because there is no school to teach you how to do this. This is old school life skills. I think street smarts have always outdone book smarts. I'm, and I think everybody in powerful position have extreme street smarts. The book smart people, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's a good thing to have, but I think the street smarts always outdo the the ability to be the best at 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 understanding how to create reality is is the power and to go through the motions and go with the flow and trust the energy and learn to listen to the signs because that's what it's all about as you're flying through the cosmos and flying through this reality you know it's like on the flow you know it's like on the on the grind and and you got to up and down and dag and left and right you know it's like mario kart and when you play mario kart you got to jump you got to throw the, the 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 turtle egg now you got to do you know you got to you got to skid out here you got to you know you just got to keep going in in what directions there's no way to play mario kart you know like it's going to be <laughs> so i think you've got to be a great Mario Carter this life. And if you're thinking that it's just straight, narrow, left, right, turn around, you are screwed because this universe is left, right, up and down, nebula, galaxy, left, right, rings that way. If you are not in that energy, you're screwed because that's the whole problem is the reality is tried to be this cookie cutter, left, right, and you'll 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 lose your this 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 energy source was not meant to be contained. Amen. Amen. That was awesome. That I can for sure say you make the best analogies ever. Like the stuff you come up with is just ridiculous. Like, oh my gosh, this makes so much more sense. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining. This this was in a very awesome episode. I am so grateful. Um, definitely, uh, it, I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone knows how to reach you, but just for those who may not know, could you let us know how, you know, we could reach you? I'll, I'll be sure to put your channel in the description box, but, you know, is there any other way um, we can reach you if you want to get a reading from you or check you out? Yeah, pretty easy. Just go on Google, type in The Leo King, and you'll see all my stuff right there. I'm on YouTube, The Leo King, and then uh, I do have an astrology website called inclusiveastrology.com. Awesome. So with that being said, uh, we'll leave you here and uh, join me next episode next week when we interview Scarlet Moon. Peace.